everyone to the Global Cafe. So my name is Katrina Bazanis. I'm a Director of Policy and Advocacy here at the IFA. So as the global population changes, there is an increasing incidence of chronic illnesses, which has an incredible burden on the lives of older people, but also burdens families, societies, and healthcare systems. Chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases greatly impact an individual's function and quality of life. As medical advancements help to increase lifespan, there's also a need to emphasize increasing health span and maintaining quality of life well into later life. So Dr. Noel McCaffrey joins us today to talk about protecting health and function for people living with chronic diseases and the different considerations, including the importance of integrated care and community health services. Dr. Noel McCaffrey is founder and CEO of Vexwell Medical, a social enterprise that offers structured, medically-led exercise programs in community settings to people with diverse chronic illnesses on referral from healthcare professionals. So he developed a master's program in sports and exercise medicine in University College Dublin in the early 1990s before spending 12 years in Dublin City University, where he led the growth of Exwell's predecessor program. And in 2019, he left DCU to drive the national rollout of Exwell. So in 2022, he was named as a United Nations 2022 Healthy Aging Top 50 World Leader. And his main passion is Exwell, and he's committed to making mission of the service available through partnerships to everyone in Ireland and beyond who would benefit from it. So Dr. McCaffrey, thank you so much for being with us today. To kick off our discussion, I want to ask a little bit a bit a little bit about your background. So I mentioned you're an expert in sports medicine um, and how that led you to kind of working with people with chronic diseases. Um, and I assume many of the individuals that you work with are older people as well. So how did you become interested in in studying medicine, particularly what sparked your interest in exercise medicine? Okay, well, good morning and uh, thank you for having me and hello everybody from wherever you are. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Ireland at the moment. Um, so I'm a doctor. Um, I started off doing sports medicine, um, largely because I was interested in sport myself. And um, the discipline of sports medicine actually combines what's called sports medicine and exercise medicine, which are actually two completely different things. It's not a good fit, to be honest, in my opinion, but sports medicine refers to musculoskeletal injuries, and um, exercise medicine is the use of exercise to prevent and treat chronic illness, really. Um, now, there's other aspects to it, but they're quite different. Um, over time, I sort of moved more towards the exercise medicine end as I settled into a lectureship role in Dublin City University, where I ran some programs. But at that time, there was an interest in developing um, what's called phase four cardiac rehab programs in the community in Ireland and we started one in DCU and it quickly grew to include non-cardiac cohorts, pulmonary disease, diabetes, cancer, chronic pain, many many different illnesses and the program grew and grew and grew and I just fell in love with it and I really really enjoyed it. I always call it exhilarating medicine. It has it's profoundly enjoyable and satisfying for us and it is a discipline which has impact and that's critical to me in terms of professional satisfaction anyway our program grew and then became under pressure to make it available throughout the country and the university i was in wasn't really interested in doing that um so i quit i just left my job in 2019 and set up um what is now called expert medical and um it's been a bit of a roller coaster journey since then, it's four years, and it's been a great success actually, uh, largely due to the great team we have and fantastic advisory board. But I suppose if we were to drill down into why is community based clinical exercise a successful enterprise once you do it well, I suppose the answer is straightforward enough because the market, if you want to call it that, is infinite effectively, like there's no end to it. Uh, in terms of chronic illness and it is a challenge which is getting the better of most structured health services and um, there's a big drive to try to move the care of chronic illness out of hospital setting into community settings and the challenge there is there just isn't enough capacity 
Um, so it's a perfect area to be in. And um, our aim is to do that. And the fact that we were doing it quite well in an environment where the market is huge and the ability of the state to serve the market is challenged. You know, it's a good, it's a good environment in which to be in this activity and we're flourishing. So we're very, very happy with the way things are going in X12. We're a busy organization, a young organization, and we are meeting so many people who are experiencing the joy of restoration of physical activity, of mobility, of confidence, of resilience, based on two things. One is the exercise and the other is the social interaction that goes with it. So um, we're in it for the long haul, Katrina. That's mm -hmm. the long and the short of it. And I think you're you're much needed. So I mean, congratulations. It's it sounds like a hugely successful program. And so I want to get into kind of all about some of uh, the goals of the program as well as dive a little bit deeper into the impact. But before we go there, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about just the impact of chronic illness on on older people and also across the life course. You know, how does living with a chronic illness affect function, you mentioned social isolation, you know, the ability to fully participate in society. Yeah. Well, chronic illness, by definition, doesn't go away. Like, that's what it is, by definition. We deal with some illnesses that are not chronic illnesses, like cancer or pre-op or post-op, knee replacements or this or that. But the, the main bulk of people we deal with are chronic illness, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, chronic pain, all that. And the reality is that people with chronic illness become less active than everybody else. Um, for a few reasons, either they become afraid of exercise, they feel it's bad for the condition, which is not true, or in particular, they develop a fear of dyspnea uh, and they avoid exercise for that reason. And one of the key messages in trying to prescribe clinical exercises to get over that, to remind people that there's nothing wrong with being breathless once it's not extreme. In fact, it's good for you. In fact, it's enjoyable. Um, they're also become less active because they're told to be by lots of people, including professionals, uh, and they could not get worse advice. And the net effect of all that is that they become less active, therefore all their fitness components fail or weaken. Each of those components of fitness, if they weaken enough, has a demonstrable, noticeable impact, be it an inability to stand up or to do your hair or put your shoe on or do the housework or get out walking. That leads to immobility, that leads to social isolation, that leads to loneliness. The combination of the mental unwellness with the physical impacts of the illness is an absolutely toxic combination. And what I think is often underappreciated is the ripple effect into families and carers of a person with chronic illness because that person needs some degree of care. And that care burden has a number of components to it. It's emotional, it's financial, it's time. And it can bring distress to the carer, which is often hidden from the person receiving the care because the person giving it does not want to make the person getting it feel worse. And that makes the person giving it suffer health effects. And that ripple effect goes beyond that into communities. So chronic illness, which affects like 85% of the population over the age 65, almost every single person will have at least one chronic illness. Um, and it affects in Ireland 40% of the entire population uh, across the age span because chronic illness does affect younger people, including children. Um, but it's an enormous burden, and the state is struggling to cope with it. Um, and in our country, the, the, the strategy now is to try to move chronic illness rehab out of hospital settings into community settings, and there are good structures being put in place for that, but those structures themselves have limitations in terms of capacity and also in terms of an exit pathway from them. And I feel that um, community-based clinical exercise fits nicely between supported care by the state, either in hospitals or in the community in that post-discharge phase. Between that and independent exercise, there is a need to provide support for people to help them to exercise. And one of the things I believe very strongly in is that there's a difference between advocating exercise, which in passing, just to remind ourselves, it is the single most important intervention for healthy aging is exercise. Um, but there's a difference between advocating for exercise, in my opinion, and actually delivering it. 
helping people to do it um, is a difference. And one of the great sources of pride for me in the work I do in our organization is that we do it. We get out there and we lead excess lasts ourselves and we help people no matter what's wrong with them, no matter what stage they're at, to do something and to experience the exhilaration of getting better. Um, so, but the impact is, just to go back to your question, is it is profoundly damaging to become inactive, profoundly, physically and emotionally. And it's easily fixed. Well, it's not easy to fix it, but the, in concept, it's easy by just introducing and supporting that person to get active. Mm -hmm. There's there's so many things to, to unpack, and I'm glad that you mentioned caregivers, because I think, in fact, the burden is higher than even kind of the statistics that you mentioned, given there's also this kind of extra layer of caregivers that are also facing a lot of challenges in in caring for for their loved ones that have that have these these chronic diseases. So I'm glad I'm I'm glad that that was something that we picked up on. Um, but the other the question that I want to ask next is there's you know, Xwell Medical, this program that you've built is clearly kind of filling a need in the community. And so I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about the program and also just how it connects to the care that people are either getting, you know, from the public health system in Ireland, um, you know, and how it connects to the different services either in hospital, um, you know, how it kind of fits into the larger you know, integration, integration of care. This is kind of something that we that we talk a lot about and hear a lot about, but don't always see um, actually executed. Okay, well, the I suppose first thing to say is that our program is medically led. Now, the, it's, it doesn't mean that there's a doctor at every, at every exercise session, because there isn't, and there's no need for that. But what it does mean is that the, the, the there's a medical input into the design of the program, number one. Secondly, there is, there is the communication between the people who refer to us and ourselves is done by our medical team if, if, if that's necessary. The medic provides support for the delivery staff and the medic will also engage with the participants at the induction session um, and as needed if, if advice or encouragement is, is necessary. But we do not take over the care of patients that stays with their GP. So the we have a referral system, so we, uh, but the referral base is quite broad. It could be hospital consultants, it could be their nurses, their, their other members of their teams, GPs, allied health professionals in community settings, social prescribers. What we, what we don't really want, to be honest, is self-referral, although somebody expresses an interest to come, we will help them to get a referral, and I suppose it's called a self-initiated referral. Um, so that's how they get in touch with us. We then link with them. We uh, invite them to come to what we call an induction session. The induction session is delivered by one of our medics, explaining the rationale for the program, the, the reason for it, what's in it, and then carrying out baseline testing. Now, the baseline testing and then repeat testing at following maybe 12 weeks on the program is critical because unless we measure impact, we can't say we're having impact. And the impact is measured on the basis of easy to administer community-based, group-based tests like the sit to stand test for strength, the hand grip test for strength, the six-minute walk test for aerobic fitness, the timed up and go test for um, frailty, the timed up and go dual task test where you add in a cognitive test at the same time to assess the ability of the person to integrate cognitive and physical tasks, which may be an early sign of cognitive decline if it's disturbed. And then self-rated health is measured with the EQ5D questionnaire. So it's very simple. And then that battery of tests is repeated and when it's repeated we generate a report for the patient and the, a copy also goes to the referrer now so and in terms of being integrated with the state services this is really a critical um issue because if organizations like ours are not integrated with the well-intentioned um state services then we will fail basically because we won't work alongside we will be viewed as a threat whereas what we need to be viewed as is a collegiate partner that does two things for the state services one it provides extra capacity if it's needed and very often it is um, and with agreed criteria on the basis of triaging some patients can bypass the community-based state services and come straight to us and thereby keep places for other people who are a bit more ill and who need it. But the second thing it provides is this exit pathway. 
because no matter with the best of intentions, the program offered by the state in the community will be finite in duration and other people need to access it and they will need to exit. And But they may still not be confident enough to be doing independent exercise. So that's where we sit. Now, so that architectural view of where in the overall model community-based clinical exercise sits is actually very important. And then alongside that, from a strategic point of view at a high level, we as XWell need to be conscious of the fact that for us to succeed, we need to be building relationships with a number of different sectors in the, in the country or community. One of those being the sort of the policy makers and the funders. And in Ireland, that's called the Health Service Executive, the HSE. Um, and, a lot, and you could put it alongside that, you could put maybe corporate funders as well, or that could be a separate body. But that's, that's a group of people who make important decisions and provide funding. Then secondly, there is this whole network of potential colleagues who would refer. So it's the referral base. And that includes all, the, all those I've mentioned, um, you know, the doctors, the nurses, all these social prescribers. And it's very, very important for our organization to have a credible, respectful relationship with these people so that they know about us and they know how to get to us. Uh, and then the third sector that we need to engage with in a very constructive way is the whole delivery arm um, of exercise programs. So in any setting in the country, we could come in with our team and do it once it's a facility, or we could partner with a local organization and support that organization to deliver our mission with our help. So we will provide the, the SOPs, the standard procedures. We would then come in and network and set up the referral base. We would provide protocols about the testing and the retesting, and we would come and do the inductions. But the actual class itself would be run by staff who are appropriately trained with our support. So that it's that, that overview of um, who we need to engage with. And then also above that, where do we sit in the overall architecture is quite important. And then the third level is the actual participant experience. Um, like it's all about the patient or participant. That's what it's about. And um, their experience of us or indeed any service, this gets into the whole concept of design, service design, it needs to be exemplary from the day they're referred. They need to be hearing from us quickly. Like there's an efficiency issue there. They need to be offered an induction within four weeks, sitting in front of us. They need to be starting a program. It needs to be easily navigated, easily understood. And then of course it needs to be enjoyable and it needs to be manageable by them, and it needs to be not stressful, and it needs to have impact. And if you can do all that, well, you're on to a bit of a winner because it becomes um, a very, very precious part of that person's week. People become very lost, we find, having been at Expo for a while, if they can't come for some reason, they're sad, they almost cancel their holidays to avoid you know, missing classes, and they just love it because it fills a niche for so many people that has just gradually taken over and changed their lives, this, this illness effect, as they slowly but surely become detached from society and lonely. And, and to see that reversed in vulnerable people, it is amazing. And I, I often um, reflect with our own team I mean, yesterday I was sitting in a class in a community centre in a part of Dublin and I saw about 40 people walking in one after the other to take part in the class. And I could say, I, I, I knew a good few of them and every single one of them had an extraordinary story to tell of difficulty, of life change or life interference based on the illness. And the reverse of that, as they began to experience the benefits within a few weeks, the incredible change and looking at a group of people, all of whom are doing something exceptional, it often is the case then that it looks as if none of them are exceptional because they're all doing the same thing. It's like watching a group of elite runners going around the lap in the Olympics. They don't look that fast because they're all going fast, but they're all doing something absolutely extraordinary. And I, I'm at pains to remind our team, all of us, that we should be very proud of seeing people doing this. A few weeks ago, we looked in awe at a lady who was awaiting her lung transplant, um, 
who's been on our program for five years. And she's one of those people who has three times gone to hospital for her, for her lung transplant and come home without it. Because as you know, when a transplant is offered, always two or three people are brought in in case the lung doesn't fit one or them. And somebody goes home disappointed every time. And she's one of them. And there she was in our class with her oxygen chamber. And she was pulling behind her. And she was running while doing this. Running. I looked at this and said, how come nobody told me she was at this? It was just an extraordinary thing to see. And because she was doing it and had been doing it for a few weeks, nobody was paying any attention to it. And it was an amazing achievement. And at different levels, we see that every single day with people who are shuffling up and down the hall running who have not run in 30 years. People have put aside their walking sticks. And it doesn't take a whole lot to achieve that. Um, we always say when we discuss, when I'm explaining to new participants attending an induction, when I'm explaining the impact evidence in summary, it's very easily summarized. And there are four key findings. The first is that everything we measure improves. And the things we measure are, are what I've told you. Strength, frailty, aerobic fitness, they all get better. The second thing is they get better quickly. Quickly, within six weeks at most, even less, there are changes seen. The third thing is that the scale of the change seen is not trivial. It is of a magnitude that makes a practical, meaningful difference. And the fourth thing, which is really important, is that those people who do the best relatively are those people who start off the weakest. And these are the very people who quite commonly lack the confidence to try the program because they're the weakest. And we can hand and heart say to you, all of you, this is me talking to the, to the crowd, no matter, what you, no matter what you have, no matter how bad it is, no matter how long you've had it, if you give this a go, you will get better. And how many people in medicine can be confident of that? Say that my work is going to have an impact. I know it. I know it. And I can say that. Uh, and all of our team can say that. And it is, that's why we call it exhilarating medicine. It's the most incredible form. It really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what an incredible impact. Um, and also, I think that's, it's so rare that people have experiences like that or, or have, you know, when they go in for healthcare services, they come, kind of come out with that quality satisfaction kind of thing. So I think that's great that that's been prioritized throughout the program. So I want to go to some questions from, from the chat. So uh, Brendan Sherlock um, has a question. Brendan, would, would you like to unmute and pose your question? Yeah, just to ask Noel, how much of a difference does it make for people who have been actively involved in sport at a younger age, does it make a huge difference or does it make any difference that they have been relatively, relatively fit while they're young and then that passes on? They, they, they're not as, I would say, restricted then when they get older. Have you found that? Have I well, explained? That's, that's, a very good, that's a very good question because... Um... In a general way, I suppose, a, a lifetime experience of activity tends to give a person the perspective of staying active if they can. Um, so they would tend, first of all, maybe not to experience the same degree of, of loss of activity as others. That's, I suppose that's one point. Um, however, a significant proportion do. For various reasons, they get ill, they get arthritis, and they just her force become immobile. Now, the point about them is, in my experience, they are very open and ex to and excited by the idea of restoring exercise because they've had it and they know it and they get it and they in they've enjoyed it in the past. It is worth pointing out, and it's a sobering thing enough, that there are a few illnesses that are commoner in people who have had a lifetime of strenuous physical activity, and that includes atrial fibrillation. Uh, some of the rhythm disturbances in the heart, believe it or not, are commoner in people who have a lifetime habit of being quite active. Now, why that happens is interesting itself, but it can be a bit of a sort of a disappointment <laughs> to people who spent their time being 
good and they suffer some uh, consequence. And, and there is some suggestion that some of the very nasty illnesses like motor neuron disease are a little commoner in people who have had a lifetime of being very active as well. Um, but to answer your question, I think, I think that people who have been active a lot are well disposed, they, they understand exercise and it doesn't take much to get them going again. Um, but they can become as affected as anybody else by illness like Parkinson's or, you know, particularly these neurological degenerative conditions. We're not spared from that by having been active. Yeah, thank you for your response. Um, just going to, to another question in the chat. So we have a question from one of our contributors, um, Schmoll, who um, is a contributor every week on the Global Cafe. Um, and he's asking about the role of occupational therapy and integrated care for older adults. Um, so I'm wondering if you can if you can touch on that. So the, the OT profession is a critical part of our referral network. We get a lot of referrals from it. And um, the, the occupational therapist is very, very clued in and very perceptive about all aspects of mobility. So that's the entire, that's the entire thrust of that profession is to restore mobility or to adjust the environment in a way that makes immobility less challenging, you know, putting in the, the stairs or or the elevated toilet seat or whatever, all these things that that um, adapt the environment to suit or address mobility concerns. But it it is the case that OTs will see patients who have mobility challenges that are not untreatable. And they're very skilled at, at, at discerning this, that because you can't get off that toilet seat, that may be a strength issue. And we can fix that, or at least we can try to fix it. So the OTs are very important in our network, very, very important. And uh, we network a lot with them. Yeah, that's a nice um, segue into a question Dr. Jane Barrett has about, about environment and functional ability. So Jane, do you want to um, pose your question? Look, thanks very much. And it's, uh, Noel, it's been many years since I was in Dublin. And I was actually had the great pleasure of um, seeing what was going on. But what strikes me is that there are there is not one particular factor that delivers success. And what struck me when I walked into the environment is there was something going on in the environment. And it had to do with staff. It had to do with um, people coming together. It had to do with the way that you, you and your team responded to individuals. So age was almost taken out of, you know, the, um, the equation. Could you address, you know, how you created this environment, you and your team, that really enables somebody to actually maintain and improve their function? So there's, there's something more than the mechanics, Noel. That, that I that I saw and felt. Well, that's really interesting, Jane. Um, I'm going to say something about age, to, just to kick this, that there, there is a little bit of an unsettling aspect to the age issue in the following way, and it's a specific one. Um, so our most of our participants are, are mature, over 65, um, but they're not all. So when we have an induction and we see a 25-year-old sitting in the room alongside 80 year olds you can imagine that that's a challenge for that person and we have literally witnessed people get up and run out of an induction because of that discrepancy in age and because of the fear that that person will experience in that i this is not for me and i is that what i'm going to be like and we've seen that in young diabetics coming into a program induction session where there's elderly people in it, and we've particularly seen it um, I have a direct experience of this with a Parkinson's dance class that we tried a few years ago where we asked people to go to it and I got in touch with one of them afterwards, how did you get on? I hated it. Why did you hate it? Well, my Parkinson's is early and I saw, I was so frightened by what I saw. Um, and we've also had that comment, it's not quite an age thing, from cancer patients, some of whom are sick of meeting cancer patients. They, they, they're, they just want to get away from it. But they see people who are in a more advanced state than them if they go to a cancer class. So there is that whole thing. 
But from the age side, on the other hand, we see people who just thrive in the environment are being adopted by almost older people who love them to bits and are inspired by them. And that is a two way process. And I suppose the message that we and, may, and this is not a structured thing, Jane, we don't have a this is how we're going to solve this problem or create. I mean, it just happens naturally. It's about the personality of the team. And all you need, in my opinion, to create a successful delivery team is to have people who are just, who have the empathy, who are just able to communicate and they simply want to help. And we have had one after another of young intern students coming to us from a sports science background and they come into our program and their ambition coming in is to be the next coach at the Australian Open tennis or something like that. And three months later, they go out and say, how can I do more of this as a career? Because over that period, they just see the impact they have. Um, and it is profound. Now, so we just try to have, we have certain core values. And one of them is that we're patient-centered. And the other is that we are openly critical of ourselves. The other is we share our knowledge openly. You know, and I'm not sure whether we're that exceptional, to be honest. I think the Irish people in general are like that. <laughs> yeah, I think but you might be right, Noel. I think you might it's, be right. It's, it's very interesting what you say about age, and there was a few little nuances on that that I think are important. And one of them is that we try, if we can, if the numbers are big enough in the class, and if we're doing station-based classes, to make one station roughly age appropriate. They're doing the very same thing, but they're just with people of roughly their own age. Yeah. And it's one of the practical challenges that has emerged over time. And some of the some of the sort of organizational issues that I try to present in a summary way there have sort of grown on me over the years of seeing them in action. This bit about the sectors we have to deal with. It's only become clear as the forest sort of clears a bit that that whole sector is one sector that we better pay attention to. And likewise, where we sit ourselves in, the, and it's the same in every country, I'd say, where does our service sit in the overall architecture of what's going on? And how can we present ourselves as a trusted collegiate partner and not a threat? That's a really important point. Um, yeah, look, thank you. It's uh, inspiring to listen to you and it's inspiring to see what happens. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. I think having that awareness as well is very important of watching those interactions and and just looking at how you can make that experience better for people. Um, so actually Eileen um, has just put in the chat, um, is there a participant of, X, of the XWell program and um, is co-signing everything that you've described about about the atmosphere created? I don't know, Eileen, if you if you want to unmute and share any any thoughts um, or any anecdotes. Uh, thanks, Katrina. Noel, thank you very much. I won't say too much because you hear me when you at the class when I ask the questions. And also you have a Friday session on Zoom where you educate us on medical terms and what you do as a surgeon when you're doing um, hip replacements and all these other bone things. But I must concur with what you say. The atmosphere is phenomenal. And I started off last year, I just went along, I saw the ad, it was being done under active age friendly communities. And there was only seven people or eight people at the induction and which Noel did. He cycles along by the way to all of our sessions. And we're, we're freezing cold in the ice and he, he's out there and he comes in saturated and then he's up on the rostrum and he's immediately um, doing the class. We don't have time to think about not doing it, to tell you the honest truth. But can I ask a question? As regards, um, one of the questions here is on funding. Um, the mixture of funding and the link between the intermediary, between being coming from the hospital with an OT and then out into the community, and which, as you know, is a very... Um, it's very scarce. How are you managing that? Um, and then at the same time, you're jumping from five in a class to 40 in a class. Well, OK, there's a few issues there, Eileen, and thank you for getting on again. So the, the issue with the class size is easy enough managed. Well, once the venue is big enough for to accommodate a bigger class, we have a, we have a ratio of 
roughly 15 to 1, you know, if there's more than 15 in the class, there'll be a second instructor either either taking part or available on site in case anybody needs help. Um, so, but the funding bit is, is interesting. Obviously, what's ideal is if the state will fund it. Um, now, we're actually doing very well with support from the HSC and our state agent for, for healthcare delivery, the HSE, gets a lot of bashing. But in actual fact, once we made the breakthrough of, of getting one funded project, they've been really, really good and we're making great progress. So I'm, I'm an advocate of the HSE at a high level. Um, we're hoping to have a presence in every region of the country within the next five years with a HSE funded project. But where we don't have it, or sorry, even when we do have it, the state can't fund somebody indefinitely. So there, there's a limit. They must get out to make room for somebody else after, say, three months. But getting out might mean getting out into staying with us, but paying a little bit. And for some people, even a little bit is a barrier. It is a barrier, and we have to acknowledge that. So the pressure will come on to try to extend the period of cover for people like that for two reasons. One, they can't afford it. But the other reason is it does seem to be the case that if somebody stops a program, they lose the benefit. No matter what we say, no matter how much we encourage them, they they just don't have the wherewithal mentally or emotionally to do it on their own. Um, and then where we don't have funding, we have a medley of or arranged, as you know, because in some places we might have some little bit of funding. And that means we can offer the class at a cheaper rate, but not. And in some places we have no funding, which means we can't do that. So we have the little, the odd situation that the same program for the punter is available at different rates in different parts of the country. And that is a challenge, but we can always explain why it is the case. And I suppose people trust us that our motive there is a social enterprise. And once it pays its way, we're delighted. The big thing is the mission. Can we get more people doing it? And um, yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, Eileen. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, Eileen. Um, I want to kind of pick up on that, you know, it's for some segments of the population that may not have access, you know, in the same way of cost, but Marianne also has a question about home care and clients that are homebound. So Marianne, um, do you want to unmute and pose your question? Um, yeah, I suppose within the home care sector, you know, we're providing home care packages to keep people at home um, as independent as possible. But the majority of our clients would be over 80 and they would be housebound. So these are not people who can go to the shop or go to church. Um, so unlike, I suppose, a nursing home, um, they can come out of their bedrooms and they go into the various activities activity rooms. This doesn't happen within um, the housebound. Um, and we're very interested when, say, you know, we have an hour with a client as to the activities that we could do with them. And I'm just wondering, um, Noel, um, where do you see XWell uh, playing a role within, I suppose, our sector? Okay, Marianne, that's very, very interesting. And it is very current. And I'll tell you where we are exactly. One of our participants is a CEO of a home care provider, and we have been working with that. It's a, it's, um, a charity up in Ballymun that, bring, that does home care, and we have done a pilot of trying to bring the Excel service into the homes of home care service users. The rationale being, as you know, that there are three major transitions in that sector. That if they happen, they are life-changing and expensive. One is becoming bedbound, the second is becoming hospitalized, and the third is transitioning to full-time nursing care. There are a lot more transitions before you hit those big ones, little step downs in functional ability, like, and they're well described, like being unable to put your shoe on, being unable to fill a washing machine or whatever. There are, there are described graded minor transitions, which are not life transforming. And then there are the big ones. And the, the idea of being able to bring exercise into the home of those people is you can postpone or defer those transitions with profound impact, profound impact. And we showed that you can do that. Now, the problem is that the model we had was that the HSE kindly funded exercise only visits for home care providers. So that some of the visits by the staff were simply to support exercise. And we had trained those staff and given them our manuals. And we had gone in and done the baseline testing and so on. But they were the ones that were facilitating or prompting the exercise. Now, that's not a long term tenable solution because the state is not going to fund one-on-one -on -one exercise sessions for everybody twice a week. It's just not feasible. 
but there is a solution and it's this um so we're at the moment working with one of the training groups to design a module that will go into the uh, training of home care providers which will be around delivering exercise um and also a second module for training the trainers so that that combination then means that over time the network of people working in that industry those who want to because it might be an elective module are able to acquire the skills necessary to go in and deliver exercise and our role might then be to support them that even if they're trained they may still need support about well what will I, what will I do here how can I progress the exercise and so on so there is a really exciting development in exactly the sector you're talking about Marianne and I think it'll be with you certainly within a year these um these modules will be will be available and I think there's and this the size of that sector is enormous as you know it's enormous and if there was a way to bring this service into that group uh, it would be it would be very very impactful and we hope it will happen yeah, we would, we'd be delighted with that, I have to say. It's very exciting to hear that. Um, no, um, very, very exciting indeed. So um, I look forward uh, to, to having that coming forward. I do know the uh, group that you're in because we're part of that consortium, actually. So um, I must get back to that person in charge, the CEO there, and have a, a word with her. We're opening up a daycare centre as well. So I'm looking at the um, activities program to keep them well um, in their community, um, whether they're housebound um, or not. So thanks very much for that uh, um, reply. It's wonderful. Yeah. No, no, that's very appropriate, actually. And just, just as an aside, this week, I was asked to go into the local prison and explore developing a service there in one of the prisons, which is for older men only. There, it's called, a, it's an open prison, um, over 55s and almost all of them will have some illness and that is the definition of a captive audience <laughs> and um and you can imagine how as as those people exit the prison having sort of a, an exercise option that they can link inside with and outside with could be a very important part of an integration um process as well there are so many angles on this um on the whole clinical exercise thing that um, there is just no end to it Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lo lots of opportunities and lots of po populations to reach in different areas, I think. And, and you're right, that integration piece is kind of a key, a key piece, I think, which are kind of bridging gaps between point A to point B. Um, so I want to go to John Peters has a question um, on promoting the service and also some connections internationally. John, do you want to pose your question? Uh, yes, um, I wanted to ask uh, if there's a, a ratio difference between uh, people using the exercise program between men and women. My personal experience is that guys don't seem to, they want to be active, they want to be healthy, but uh, they're loath to join exercise programs. Um, where my wife goes for some exercise program here, uh, there are very few men. And I wondered if uh, what you are doing can <clears throat> can be promoted in the community uh, through men sheds, uh, who are all mostly all older guys and uh, s slipping slowly and slowly into uh, inactivity. Uh, uh, I've started a bit of uh, physio myself recently and uh, can uh, uh, say how much it's helped me even in a few weeks. So a lot of what you're saying, um, I recognize as true for myself. How can we uh, reach out to men in particular and men sheds both in Ireland and internationally would be a, a, a huge market to to get older people, the male half of the population, to be uh, more yeah. physical. So, John, thanks for that. Um, can I just say we do link with men, men sheds in in some of our our, our centres. Number one, um, it is it is a strategically good thing for us to focus on. We haven't done enough of it, but we are moving that direction. Number one. Number two, just to answer your question. In our own situation here. Um, 
the, the gender ratio varies a bit, but by and large, it's about 50-50, by and large. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that the referral bit, which doesn't distinguish between men and women. And, and sometimes as well, what happens is um, when we come to an induction, we often have what we affectionately call bodyguards sitting down beside the person who's referred to help him or her fill in the forms or do the testing. And that person who sits down beside him or her is usually coming anyway to the class to bring the partner. So we invite them to take part. Um, and that works well also. Um, now, on the, med shed, on the men's shed thing, um, one of the interesting things about twice recently I've been approached about our program and it has been referred to as being suitable for whoever was asking me about it for one, and the same phrase was used. It was, just, it was I was told that what you have is a perfect off the shelf package, by which was meant it's end to end. The referral, the information, the induction, the baseline measurements, the program content, the retesting, the reporting, monitoring dropout, all that, as well as good old insurance put in there as well. And that it was mentioned to me by one was a national sports organization that was interested in talking to us about working with us as part of their healthy club activity, which is often a part of any sports organization. And the other group that approached us was actually a humanitarian aid group. And most of us would have the view, or my, I misunderstood, I thought that the humanitarian, um, the MSFs and all these, that they were mainly doing disaster response, but they're not. They're actually getting embedded in the local healthcare system ongoing, including primary care. And when I asked this person, well, sure, we do secondary prevention of chronic illness. That's what we do. And she said, that's exactly what we want because we are actually partnering with the local health organization in Eritrea or wherever and getting involved in primary care, including good old secondary prevention in primary care. I didn't know that. So that it, it is interesting. And for your organization, Men's Sheds, if there was an interest in an off the shelf solution, say to exercise as well as all the other good work that you're doing, well, maybe we have a package that might work, you know? Um, so we do talk to Men's Shed, not enough, I expect, and we should do more of it, Peter or John, we, we should do more of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks for that, for that answer. Um, I want to, we are coming close to the end of time. So I'm, I am gonna go to you for, for key messages, Dr. McCaffrey, but I do wanna ask one last question, which is, what do you see as the future of, of the program? What are kind of your next goals to achieve for the program? And just in general, how do we create, get more programs like this that actually have an impact, are, you know, help people to help people, but also to help relieve kind of the burden on some of these systems that we're seeing kind of across the globe pretty much? Well, I suppose my vision my ambition, my dream is that Xwell, Exercise for Wellness, will be available anywhere in the country, Ireland that is, to anyone who would benefit from it. Now, we are better at the face-to-face -face group offering than the online. We never got good at the online. We didn't like it. Our punters didn't really like it. Some of them do, but we just never mastered it at a high level. We have an offering now that may be interesting in that regard, but we, which it basically is we recorded classes of graded intensity over 11 different levels combined with an algorithm to allow self-management of progression between those based on you know tolerance of the class the appropriate level of dyspnea no adverse events at a given level long enough objective tests improving willingness to change tolerance at the new level like there's an algorithm there which is interesting in that it gives somebody a pre-recorded classes and a mechanism for transitioning and we want to make that open source when it's available if we can so there's that so the, the combination of online and face-to-face -face, we'd like to be everywhere in ireland and we would like to partner with everybody else doing good work so that we're all doing the same thing ideally with the same protocols and the bigger the sample size so to speak the more research and impact measurement we can do in a coherent way now 
we haven't really turned our eyes too much yet to working outside the country, but there are one or two ways we could, and we just are delighted to share our knowledge and learn from others as well. So there's that. Um, so that's how we see ourselves. I mean, I, I, I started this whole thing when I was 59. <laughs> I'm only, I feel I'm only starting my career, and uh, but I, I probably, obviously, I'm not going to be leading this into the next 20 years. But at the same time, I'm, I feel so grateful that I've got a new lease of life myself personally at this stage of my career where I just could not be happier at what I do. Um, so to answer your question, that's what I'd like. Now, and I think the trick then is to persuade, with good reason, the state agencies and other operators that we want to be partners, not to take over the show. We want to partner and learn from and take guidance from and offer something to other sectors. For, for example, there will be people in the hospital systems or who are very interested in doing research. We have the most unique human lab. In fact, our big ambition on the research side to start in the next two years is to start a chronic illness cohort study. And that will make an enormous contribution to information and guidelines across many, many disciplines, excluding ours. We want to facilitate this because ours is a service, not a research center, but we want nothing can interfere with the service, but fantastic research can be done. And I'm sure that's the sort of thing that Jane and ourselves might get together about in due course. But the idea of um, recruiting 10,000 people with chronic illness and monitoring over 10 years, what happens? What are the factors that predict responsiveness to exercise that might then target or facilitate, well, who should we target? Like what, there, there's an incredible amount of knowledge that we can gather and share because we now have this enormous cohort of people who are only delighted to help. Um, and, and that is a very, very big part of, of what we hope to achieve in the next five years is this research bit. Thank you for your response. And um, I want to turn to you for some final key messages. I'll give you just a moment to, to compile your thoughts. Um, and in the meantime, I want to introduce our speaker for next week's Global Cafe. So next week, we'll be talking about um, advocacy strategies in protecting and respecting the rights of older adults across Australia with Mr. Craig Keir. So I hope you'll all join us uh, next Friday for, for that talk. Thank you, Lona, for sharing that. And then I'll go back to you, Dr. McCaffrey, just for some final key, key takeaway messages as we come to, to the end of our session. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really honored, delighted, chuffed to be here uh, and to get a chance to speak to um, friends and colleagues from around the world. I really am. I suppose my message is very simple. Um, exercise is incredibly impactful for health, number one. Number two, another key message is the difference between advocating and delivering. I think it's for us in the community of healthcare enhancement to, to do it and not talk about doing it. Um, and I, I think that's the most important message is to not leave it at just advocacy, but to do our best to implement as well and to explore the challenges around implementation and see can we help solve them because that is what will make a difference. Thank you so much. And I have to echo all of the, the comments, just commending your, your passion. I think it's, it's always great to hear somebody that speak who's so passionate about, about what, what they do and that, that definitely comes through in your work. So thank you so much for being with us today. I think that's a, that's a great uh, point to end on. Yeah, did you wanna, any? No, I see a few Irish friends here on, I wanna thank you for coming out as usual. <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you yeah thank you to everyone for, for coming out that just shows what a great community you have um that people are people just want to come out and and support um so i think that's that's great and we have to thank you so much for being here i think that's a great 
Um, like you said, exercise is the most important um, intervention. And so I think the fact that you're implementing this and also can provide sort of a template for other people, for our colleagues that are coming, joining in and tuning in today from, from across the globe, I think that's also a very important, um, it's, a, it's an important model that you've that you've built. Um, so thank you so much for, for being with us today. Do, 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 do you mind if I just flag one thing on, on September sure. the 9th? If anybody's interested, uh, we're holding a mass event in Dublin. It'll be a health fair for people with chronic illness and with cancer. And um, we may stream it or we may link back with you, Katrina, to see can we stream it. But it's, a, it's an event that will include a mixture of, and it's aimed at people who have illness and also living with people who have illness. We're hoping to have a thousand people in one venue for this day at which we will have participation elements. We will have education elements. We will have information from providers. We hope to do a bit of real-time research on the day that might include a mixture of testing and reporting some work that we ask people to register to do before they arrive. There will also be forums and focus groups for participants so that we can get the participant voice and maybe generate some position statements. And there'll be a little bit of entertainment. So <laughs> Great. We will be advertising this later, and if anybody would like to attend or come along, you're very, very welcome. Great. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, you so much for thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and yes, well, happy to share um, to yeah. anybody on the line that's that's interested or make that connection. So thank you so much. So I think that's a great that's a great point to leave it on. So I hope. Um, thank you so much again, Doctor Doctor McCaffrey, for being with us. Thank you to to the whole IFA team that helps to put on the Global Cafe every week and we'll see you next week, next Friday. Mm -hmm.